anybody else want to come on stage? I mean, speech, I think everybody is loving what they're hearing from you, but I definitely, y'all, she does so much. She's an activist, entrepreneur. She's a mom, great mom, grandmom. Um, you know, I mean, come up here and, and ask the sister a question. Kelly, you got your hand raised. You go, of course, you're going to be able to speak. Anybody else, please raise your hand. We're going to let you up on stage so you can ask a question. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Kelly. Okay. Yeah. Um, Miss Michi, I have a question for you as far as, and this is a softball question, um, regarding black schools, uh, regarding Zyax, regarding um how you feel about that and what contributions as far as um with your survival classes, is that something that's being offered? And I'll leave it there. Let you go there. Okay. Well, um, I think that we have to begin to build all of our own stuff for our people. Um, when you talk about the systems, they definitely are not designed for us. They're actually designed in a bad way. So the public school is the last place I would ever put my child. Um, I've homeschooled my children for a while. Um, so building black schools, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and putting your children in black schools. Let me say, when we did, <coughs> y'all excuse me, I'm, I'm getting over being under the weather. Um <clears throat> But when we did the Black Agenda, um, we um, even allowed in the places where the nation had accredited schools, you could send your kids. I know people send their kids to private school, Catholic school, and they black. You know, they ain't even Catholic, right? So even sending them to one of those schools is better than sending them to a public school. Um, and so our schooling for our children is important. Now, Zyax, um, I actually have been partnered with Zyax for many, many years, um, probably over half of the students in Zyax are, are parents that have come from my platform. Uh, my children have all gone to Zyax. Um, and I think that it is a great school. They are constantly adding new things all the time as um, they are growing. Q is a really great brother. He puts 24-7 into that school. I will be honest with you. I have literally watched... Um, Q stay there all day with them kids, be there till nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, go downstairs with the young kids that are teenagers and they're learning how to engineer and he's in the studio with them. And then he goes to sleep on the couch and gets himself together. And then the kids are there again. Sometimes Q don't even go home. Um, and so he is very dedicated to the children. Um, and I, I have so much respect for him and Marsha and everything that they're doing. Um, and as far as that, we actually are talking um, about this year coming up. I've been so busy, um, but it is definitely something I would like to offer to the school. And Q's always open for anybody who wants to come and teach the children something else they should know. But I'm actually going to be teaching um, the way to make money online to all of the students. Um, we're hoping for the high schoolers that as they graduate, their 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 senior project will be to start an online business. Um, and so we are looking forward to doing that. I will tell you that for the students that are in Brooklyn, um, they actually do go and do airsoft. So they do go to the gun range. Uh, when they've come here to Atlanta, we take the kids on field trips and things like that. Um, and they do take the kids to the gun ranges um, when they're in spaces, they can do that. New York's a little different, um, but they do do airsoft. So for the kids that are there, he takes them out to teach them combat and how it is to not just shoot a gun, but how do you maneuver in the middle of that combat with a gun? And so um, Zyx does actually um, do these things and teaches the children a lot of stuff. They add things every year. And so we get really wonderful people from the community. It's a true grassroots um, effort and um, people are always coming forward every year saying, look, I'm a teacher or I teach music or I do this and that. And I would like to offer my services to the kids. So um, those programs are always growing. And I can speak to that one personally. As far as the other ones, if we're building something for the children, that's where it all starts. Um, the conditioning and the school to prison pipeline. I mean, like we could be here for days talking about this stuff, but um, with the school to prison pipeline and, um, you know, the conditioning that goes on in the public schools, um, and the fact that you can be tried for felonies for fighting now. I don't know if you guys know that. Um, uh, in all schools, they have wow. contracted the um, justice system to be the disciplinary now. And so I don't know if you guys have experienced this yet, if anybody's on here with children. But when your child does something, instead of like just suspending them now, they'll give them like a ticket. And they have to actually go to court. And they'll require you to pay or they require your children wow. to do like community service. But what they're doing is creating a criminal 
record. So the the mm -hmm. public school psychologically pushes your children out into the streets, right? Especially with black boys. Um, they will yeah. push them yes, out by the environment that they put them in, whether people understand this or not, psychologically. So when they go to school, they're in uniforms and these uniforms are getting them prepared for prison because you wear uniforms. You don't address children anymore by their um, name. It's their student ID number, right? Because that's your prison number. A lot of inner city schools have uh, metal mirrors in the bathroom now. That's just like a jail cell. I've been in one. If you have, you know that's where it comes from. Um, these are in inner cities. Our kids have been walking through metal detectors long before they ever got them for the white schools. And um, those are the schools getting shot up. So I don't understand. Them, but I do understand, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so as the kids are sitting in the classroom, what you find is that the rules of don't have any personality. That is when children should. They say they have uniforms because of poverty and it helps you. Bullshit, okay? Let me tell you something. What it does is it takes away at a time where your child is trying to develop character and decide who they are with their style, their look, hair. That's when you experiment. Like, I'm tired of seeing 40-year-old women with blue hair. So let these babies have their blue hair when they in high school. But you take everything away from them. You strip them down to a uniform and the reason you're doing this is because you want them to have no personality be identified by a number at a time when they should be growing you're stunting that growth most inner city schools detroit parents sued um the board of education there because they have a very very high rate and it's not the only city of people who have high school diplomas but they are illiterate. How do you have a 12th grade high school diploma, but you cannot read? So they sued the school board and the school board was found to not be at fault. And they were said that they have no obligation to make sure your children can read. But wait a damn minute. If I keep my kid at home and don't go by your guidelines, you'll be at my door telling me I'm going to jail because I haven't relinquished my child to you. But then you tell me I have no obligation to teach your child a damn thing, right? So when they do this, your children Children are in school. They're getting an adequate teaching. When black boys raise their hand, this is statistically, they ask questions. They get way more punishment for things that their other counterparts do not that are not black. What happens is those brilliant black boys and black girls are right behind them. The environment becomes too tedious. They're always told they don't do anything right. They're spending more time in the office. So now they're getting behind on more classes. Now they're failing. And where there was brilliance based on their grading system, the way that they do it, they begin to make your child feel like a failure. Your child is then going to run out in the streets and start skipping school, which they're surely going to get into trouble at that time, being stolen cars with the gangster boys outside that don't go to school. Like it's a whole cycle and people believe it don't work this way it does. And then when your child gets caught up in that crime, that one crime they should have had their ass in school, right? That's something that can give them some real time. What they do is they take all of those suspension tickets that your child got and they use it against them because now it's a court record. And they say, this child seems to be really rebellious. There is no help in the juvenile system because they will not listen. So your honor, we would like to ask the court to move this to adult court and to try this juvenile as an adult. Once you get that child into the prison system, their mind is still moldable and malleable. If you can keep them until they're about 26, you have honestly created a lifelong slave because they will become very institutionalized. And when they get out, they're going right back. And so this is the school to prison pipeline. It exists. I didn't make it up. I didn't even coin that term. You can look it up yourselves, but this is how it works. And so Putting your children in public school is the worst. Now, I know people are going to say, I have, I've seen black kids go through public school. I've seen them go to college and graduate and do wonderful things. Absolutely, right? But I will tell you, too, that every year the criminal justice system is shifting because it wasn't until about two years ago they started to say they can try your child in school with a felony for getting into a fight. Now, that's up to the discretion of the officer in the school on what they would like to charge that child with, right? This is where we started to see them putting eight-year-olds in handcuffs because one girl threw a tenture tantrum and hit her teacher because she tried to take her Halloween candy. So it's evolving every day very quickly is what I'm telling you. And you're not going to see as many productive black people coming out talking about some sama cum laude and going off to Harvard. That ain't happening, baby. To most of our children, that is not happening. So we have to get our children out of these schools. I'm not even going to go into the conversation because we could be here all night about the condition of the LGBTQ within the school system. Now, shout out oh, to the LGBTQ. Oh, I was going to ask about that. I was going to ask you about <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh. Well, I would say this. 
that is something that they are projecting on your children too. I think that is very perverted. I think that if you understand your government, you will see these are not all conspiracy theories. When you look at the people who are called to the carpet, people in high places that run all of the media and run the government are the people who are doing all of these things that has to do with sex trafficking and children, not to get into the conspiracy theories right now, but um, they are very real. And so know that the government is using that movement. So let me say anybody that's in the black community that's in the LGBTQ, I don't feel these are their doings. This is a co-opting of the movement from the government because if you go ask people in the LGBTQ community, they will say, nobody asked me. I didn't vote or sign anywhere for them to put our curriculum in the school. We didn't even ask for that, right? But they just did it. And right. so even a lot of them don't agree with it. So let's not make no mistake that the government let them have all those rights so now they could co-opt the movement. They've taken the movement and now they're moving forward with their own agenda. And yes, your children are being taught how to masturbate now in school in kindergarten mm -hmm. and first grade this is not a lie it's not a joke they're teaching your children all of these things from the time they're in kindergarten now they're teaching them gender mm -hmm. things as far as a boy can be a girl they are telling your son he can change his sex if he wants children are getting in trouble and being suspended like it's a hate crime if there's a boy named todd one year he comes back the next year now he wants to be tina and you're confused and your son's nine and he's like but that's todd and they're like no he's tina and when he calls him the wrong neighbor, he's like, but you're a boy. Why you got on her dress? Now your child's in the office mm -hmm. for, 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 for harming with their words this child that has their mm -hmm. gender of whatever they want. This is the most ridiculous shit I ever heard. It is perverted and it is coming for your children. So that's just another reason. Get them the hell out of their school because you can't even opt out of these programs. Yep. So they won't teach my child how to read. They won't guarantee my child can read wow. in 12th grade in the inner city, but you're going to make sure my child know how to masturbate. If you don't get the hell out of here, y'all better get your babies out of these schools. Right. Ali, did you, right. you, you have something to say? Because I, I had something to follow up with what Michi just said. <laughs> yeah, did you see the book, Michi, called The Gay BCs? Yes. Yes. That was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm hmm and this is the type of stuff that they read to y'all kids. It's a, it's a poly. It's a poly. It is. When you really take the time. And I know a lot of our people are in survival mode. So you go to work every day. It ain't always your fault. I'm, I'm not saying it is. And I don't want anybody to feel that way. This is why I feel like I want our people to find some financial freedom. Like, I don't want you to go online and look for these courses people give you and these promises to make you wealthy. But what I do want you to do is be realistic and at least replace the income you make from an employer. And if you make a couple thousand dollars a month, like just do that for yourself. So every day you're building something for you and you don't have to go to somebody else's place because it gives you time to think. It gives you time to see. We're in survival mode. So we go to work all day long. Our children are being raised by the public school. A lot of people are like, Michi, I can't even put my kids in homeschool because what I'm going to do because I got to go to work. See, that's the cycle of not giving you the freedom of making the choices choices with the child you birthed. And you think, people will tell you, you do have a choice, but no, you don't because the government and the oppression and the slave uh, mentality of this world and capitalism and society got you in survival mode while they taking control of your babies. And you're going to look up one day and you're going to come home and your son is going to tell you he thinks he's a girl and you're not going to understand what the fuck happened and it's because mm -hmm. you are too busy it's not your fault but you're too busy and you aren't raising your children social media is the school department is and you can't whoop your kid ass but child protective services can take your babies and they'll end up in sex trafficking on my mama 82 percent of all children mm -hmm. rescued from sex trafficking were foster children so so, so see, yes. you don't wow. even have the right to discipline yes. your kids anymore. You better snatch your babies back from this government. Hey, Michi, I wanted That's to like follow up. The foster hey, children Arthur, is Arthur. having real bad in Chicago. Hey, Arthur, hold on a second. I wanted to, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can y'all hear me? Okay. I wanted to just follow up on what uh, Michi just said because this is really, really important. On Saturday, I had an opportunity to go in. Michi, there's a group on Twitter Spaces, and it was a lot of people in there, and they're called Gays Against Grooming. And it was like people were in there saying, look, 
We are not for pushing this on these kids. The kids are off limits. Do not touch these kids. And they're talking about how they're getting bullied by the left. Uh, you know that they're getting bullied, saying that you're you're betraying us and all this other crazy stuff. And they were like, "No, this is not. We don't want kids groomed. Leave these babies alone. Don't have you know." parades and things where you got your genitalia exposed and you got families there. We want to be family friendly. Why are you doing things like this? And they're getting just beaten up by other people. And they're so, I mean, definitely what you're saying is just, I, I was, I was kind of stunned. They say, look, we don't control the media to be able to control the narrative. That sounds very parallel to where we are as a freedman community. So they're they're working with the groups and organizations who are controlling the narrative, and that got people just mad at them, and they're like, "No, we're totally against grooming of these babies." So uh, I appreciate everything that you just said. Uh, I'm gonna go to Sister uh, Evanston, uh, Sister Rose. How you doing tonight, sis? Hi. Good good evening, everybody. I'm I'm just sitting here listening. Oh my God. Uh, uh, well, um, I just thank you for for having this this. Uh, I hear myself in here. I, I've got a grandson, uh, a 15 year old, and I've got a uh, he's 10 year old in in uh, the school system here in Evanston, and it's we see what's going on and they're teaching them all sorts of things. And of course I'm not the custodial parent, so I can't, I can't jump up and say, don't teach my grandchild this, but my 15 year old, I do sit and talk to him and he's pretty much aware of, of, of the LGBTQ uh, movement. And he says, you know, granny, we have to watch where, and he's in, he's a sophomore or he's a rising junior. He says, you know, granny, we have to watch where we sit in the lunchroom. And I said, what do you mean? He said, if we sit at a table where there are LGBTQ people and we are not, you know, politically correct, they will get up and start telling people all around that this table of guys over here is being mean to the LGBTQ wow. people. And he said, he said, we have to be very careful. And I said, tell me how that makes you feel. He said, well, it makes me feel I'm scared. He said, because one girl actually threatened me that she was going to tell everybody in school that I was against LGBTQ. And I said, she actually did that. She said she was going to do that. And he said, yeah, granny. And I said, well, how do you feel about it? And he said, I was scared, Granny. I didn't want her to tell everybody because then people would start beating me or they would start hitting me and start talking about me. And I was just, let's just say I was floored. You know, I'm, I'm from the boomer generation and um, I'm, I've just seen it all. That, that, and, and this is, this is, you know, I don't want to say it's the worst uh, because I have friends that are that are LGBTQ. And, and when I say friends, they're close in friends, but they're younger people. But I found out that one of my friends has a, a child. Uh, she has two girls and a boy. And I, I said something, you know, gender specific about the boy. And she's, oh, oh no, he's, he's, uh, he's, what is the terminology? Uh, he, he's, um, oh, I, he's, well, basically, he's not, he's not gender specific. And I can't think of the terminology that they use. And I said, non, and I, and I, I think it yeah, is. he's right. He's, he's non-binary. And I, you know, I just said, what? She said, yeah, he's non-binary. He dresses, we let him dress however he wants to and stuff. And I was just floored for a while, speechless for a few minutes, but I land my plane with that. But I, I understand I understand what you folks are talking about because I've I've seen it evolve in 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 these generations now and it's and it is I, I, you know I hate to sound like this but it feels like a conspiracy against our children it it really does um, and I land my plane with that but thank you guys for having this room 
Thank you, Miss Rose. Go ahead, mm -hmm. Arthur Ward or Michi, either or. I think Arthur got his hand up. Yeah, I just want to tell Michi that that uh, the foster uh, parent situation in Chicago is really bad when it comes to the grooming problem, but the media here is not allowed to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, can we go down that rabbit hole a little bit more? The media is not allowed to talk about it. So then I would ask you who owns the media? And when you look at who owns the media, you get into who owns Disney, who owns everything else. And you see the reason why it's not talked about is because they own the media and they own the networks. And they're the ones that don't want it to be talked about because they have a big hand in a lot of this stuff, you know. Um, and Chicago is a big place for stuff like that. Absolutely. Chicago is also a big place where there's been a lot. The media doesn't want to talk about it either. Um, organ trafficking, where there's been places found with body parts, organs, things inside of, you know, warehouses. So, yeah, people being found killed, but the media won't talk about it. But their organs be missing sometimes. So that stuff is 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 real. Right. And Chicago is unfortunately one of those places that you find a lot of that high stuff going on, high sex trafficking and all of that. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, go I'm ahead, Ali. No, I was just going to say, speaking of Disney, it, it's interesting bringing that up because we were watching, I think, the last um, Doctor Strange. And the last Doctor Strange movie there's a girl in there that and she's kind of central to the plot and she has two mothers. She has two mothers. She comes from a whole other galaxy uh, or whatever, man, but she's got in, in her back in her galaxy. They, she's got two mothers and I feel like Disney is uh, playing a role in pushing certain, you know, certain ideologies uh, towards the, towards the children as well. Absolutely. Have Has anybody ever stopped to take the time to listen to some of the Disney stars that have become adults and as children, them talk about what happened when they were there and how it wasn't as nice of a place. They talk about sex stories and things that happened, but people don't listen to them. They usually are strung out on drugs. It's usually the ones who what happened to them was so devastating that it affected them in a way that they didn't carry on with their career, right? The ones that have got caught up in it to where they've accepted it, they're willing to live this life or whatever it may be so that they can have the fame that they have. Like all of that comes at a price, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, they this has been talked about for a long time. Um, I think that uh, I, they have a, a new transgender princess or something. You know, I think it's interesting that they make all the, the boys girls. Um, I don't see a lot of promotion of making girls boys, though. Um, I don't, you know, I don't, I, when we talk about transgender, it's always a boy being a girl mm -hmm. or a man being a woman. You never show it like a woman can be a transgender too, you know, and she wants to be a guy, but they don't really show you that, you know. Um, I think period in society with b the black group, the black race, yes, but even with everybody, I think the government understands that men are the strength in anything. And so we're going to take away guns. We're going to turn everybody into little bitches. You know, it's the same thing from the plantation and they do it on a large scale now to everybody. But it's like, we're just going to turn all of the masculinity because we defuse that weapon, right? So we don't have to worry about them giving us pushback. If you turn all the men into bitches and, you know, and, and all the women are women anyway, we don't care about them turning themselves into men because at the end of the day, we know you're still a girl, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. You you find that they why don't they project it both ways? There's an agenda there. Um, yeah, and so Disney well, they has a big part to play. To, hey, Sister Michi, they always basically try to tell women um, that oh, you can beat up. I mean, I'm, I'm so sick of seeing these movies where they have the women just pouncing and trouncing men in a fight. That is just absolutely ridiculous, especially if upper body, um, you know, hand-to-hand -hand boxing or something dealing with strength. We are not going to beat up men hand-to-hand -hand right. without f weapons of some kind of sort and training. Uh, I mean, massive amounts of training because men are just so much <laughs> stronger than us in dealing with upper body. I work out every, five, you know, five days a week strength training endurance everything i cannot 
hand to hand just beat up a guy. I mean, people don't understand that. And you don't see the bruises in TV. You don't see the marks. You don't see the broken bones. So they have this false sense of security. Oh, I can hit a guy, but he can't hit me. When I was teaching in high school, there was there were girls that were like, I can hit him, but he's not supposed to hit me back, right? And I said, no, you keep your hands to yourself because you're giving that guy license to hit you. Don't do that. I mean, you just basic courtesy things that you know the kids weren't even understanding then I went to elementary school and you see things in the elementary school level and one of the things I refused to do in these elementary schools you're talking like pre-k uh second grade I'm not teaching these babies certain uh, oh well you can't say you can't say that th this that, I mean they're, they're they're saying okay well a girl boys want to play football they want to tackle I let them tackle. Why not? Then the girls want to play. Well, don't tackle me. Well, you can't play this game. Go over here where they playing the flag football. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, they were like, "Well, Miss Mickey, is you, you, uh, hey, guess what? I played uh, tackle football because I just got. I it made me better because I I didn't want to get to tackle right. So if I had to play, I learned to get better. So I wouldn't get tackled. I learned to juke people. I learned how to run faster. It got me way better than sitting up there not playing at all or like, hey, if it wasn't flag football. But they, you, why don't the, then the girls are like, why don't the boys come and pick flowers? I said, they don't want to pick flowers. You go pick flowers. You can't make them go pick flowers if that's not what they want to do. And those boys were like, wow, Miss Mickens, you are like a different kind of teacher. Other other teachers would have made us go and do what the girls wanted. And I, that's just absolutely ridiculous to me. As a child, you do what you want to do as far as playing a game at recess or whatever the case. I'm not making the boys go and pick flowers. Now, I did have them planting tomatoes and herbs at, in the classroom, and they got good at it. Those kids were growing green like crazy. They were growing um, basil, oregano. Uh, we had tomatoes, cucumber. They were growing all kinds of vegetables. But that's something they enjoy doing and seeing the growth and plotting it for science class and things like that. But I don't make them at, at playtime. I don't make them go out and do things that they're not comfortable with. And that's something that they're trying to push in these elementary schools. I'm sorry, anyone else that had their hand up that had a question for Sister Michi? Come on, fam. I know y'all want to ask a question. <laughs> they like getting this good game from you, though, Michi. They like listening to hear you talk. So that I, we appreciate you for that, indeed. Absolutely. Absolutely. I thank you for having me here. You know, I, like I said, it's so much that we could talk about. It, it just goes on and on. I call them the rabbit holes. And you go down one, it's always several offshoots from that one. And those got some offshoots too. They <laughs> lead you from here to over there. Because everything we've talked about tonight seems different, but it's all connected. It really is. It's the matrix that we live in. You know, people like to talk about that a lot. But when you wake up from it, man, I, I, I think... Baldwin said the truest thing, like to be conscious is to be in a constant state of rage. Like when you know the truth, mm. I can't watch TV. Um, you know, things that brought me joy in my ignorance because ignorance is bliss. I no longer am allowed the ability to to enjoy them <laughs> because, you know, and, and so it's sad to say that like, I don't celebrate holidays. Um, now, the, and this is the funny thing. I you don't watch Martin. You don't watch Martin reruns, me too. I do not. I, I, you know what? <laughs> I have a big ass TV on the wall in my room, and I don't know the, if I come on. I'm watching YouTube, so don't get me wrong. I selectively choose what I want to watch, um, but yeah, like I, I don't know the last time about five, six years I've turned on a TV like, oh, let me, you know, watch the news. When I go look at the news, I'm seeking it out on purpose to see what's going on. Um, I don't really sit back and watch TV shows. I don't know what the heck is on TV. No, I don't. I don't know. I spend a lot of time with myself. 
Um, you know, I think a lot. Um, I analyze stuff a lot. I don't know. But but that's, again, ignorance is bliss. You know what I mean? I don't celebrate holidays. I don't get me wrong. My life is not sad. But at the same time, like, I don't. So most people think that that's fun. And so while everybody else is having their moments, don't get me wrong, everybody off work. So if you invite me over, I'm not like, bye, humbug. I'm a cum, but I'm not finna bring no presents and don't buy me shit. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not finna play into this whole thing. I'm not going to get a Christmas tree. I'm not putting up no lights. Like, don't get me wrong, but you know what I am going to do? I am going to make money every single holiday, okay? But I am not going to spend my money. Absolutely not. You know, I might find a nice deal, but I'm not going into the celebration thing behind every holiday. There is a really stupid thing behind it. Sometimes it's it's like fucked up stuff in your face. Like, OK, for example, St. Patrick's Day. OK, um, now everybody's like this black is like I Irish. So why do I care? You know, and then at the end of the day, if you knew the whole story, you might have been Irish because. Um, St. Patrick actually uh, committed genocide, killed a whole group of the Pygmy tribe, right? Um, known as the TWA. Um, and they were actually the first Black settlers there, right, in Ireland. And so they actually are small. The men only go over a little over four feet, but they practice beliefs in communing with the ancestors. They use the herbs from the ground. They manifested and spoke things into existence. And this is where the luck of the leprechaun comes from. That's why it's a little person, but they've turned him into a white person. And look at the end of the rainbow and all, all of that stuff, right? Um, when really that story comes from the TWA tribe, right? And so um, he murdered all of them. But so you sit there and say, ah, oh, St. Patrick's Day ain't got nothing to do with me. And then those that don't care, they just like, it's a reason to drink. I'm putting on some green and you look crazy with it, you know, being black with your, you know, St. Patrick's Day stuff on. But if we knew the real truth, like we have, some of us have ancestors. They might have been your ancestors. So maybe you, you shouldn't be celebrating this day, but maybe you shouldn't. So it's like, if you really look at the history of all of this, like what do Christmas got to do with, with Jesus? Like if you're a Christian, you better stop that stuff because it is pagan. Let's just be real. But I don't want to hurt your feelings because there I go taking away your ignorance. So stay in your bliss because the tree ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. Um, Neither do no lights, no reindeers or lying to your kids and telling them some fat white man that came down the chimney and gave them some. Why is a fat white man a savior? If you are going to give your kids some shit and, and go into debt and over time for dumbass lie, it's going to be broke in a week no matter whether you get it from the dollar store or Macy's and you spend all of this money, you give it to your children and then you won't even take credit and be their superhero. Like ain't nobody That's came right. down the chimney and gave you this. I worked extra hours for this. At least make them fucking respect it. Like it, holidays is all backwards. So don't get me wrong. I celebrate when there's a reason to celebrate. I don't make my kids wait till Christmas to get that new coat. It's cold. We just gonna go buy the damn coat. You want something special? Did you earn the mm -hmm. shit? Do you think you deserve it? Like, we live life in the moment. We had a really great moment this week. Let's just go out to eat and celebrate or let's just get a cake because you know everybody was doing well this week you done got your driver's license damn it you done done what you supposed to do you got your first apartment i think we should all celebrate as a family like we pick those moments and so i do celebrate but no i don't buy into a whole lot of the matrix and because i see it for what it is so when most people are doing what they're doing i'm doing something completely different which puts me and my family in a position of like being loners and we don't do what everybody else does so it's us and we have to be cool with that most people need to be in society and be accepted i live a quarantined life you know oftentimes i walk in the store and forget it's a holiday like what the hell is all these people in? oh it's labor day oh it's valentine's day you know i'd be forgetting i don't i don't and because i work for myself sometimes i don't even know if it's monday or tuesday like i don't know what today is right now <laughs> but it's okay you know yeah. um so yeah like i completely as much as i can i try to detach from this society and this matrix of games that's webbed into this evil as we with all these rabbit holes that we don't get and i get why people don't get it because I had to not be a slave to survival and I had to be able to sit in my room for two years, you know, and be depressed and be like, does this shit ever change and do some studying? And in that study, and it led me from here to over there to over there, I just 
suffer promised myself I wouldn't suffer from cognitive dissonance and you do not know how many bubbles got bust for me like what I gotta let this go to what and we're not gonna do this tonight y'all but I am gonna say this what Jesus ain't real Christianity it was oh. some slave stuff what I, I used to be a pastor y'all I used to be I a was, pastor I had to let I it go. Ready to go there I was getting ready to ask you about that I was gonna ask you about that I was gonna say look uh, on our program, Be the Power, we had actually covered the Lovecraft Country series when it came on, and we were talking about hoodoo and witchcraft and stuff like that. And um, I, I've heard a couple of your um, YouTube programs where you were talking about certain things. And so I was going to bring up some of that stuff, but it's up to you if you want to go no. into it or not. No, no, no. We can go anywhere y'all want to go. I, I'm just saying that for this. I don't know whose audience is whose. If you're cool, I'm cool. Yeah, you, you, know what mean, you know what I mean? You know, everybody got to understand. And I might, y'all might love Jesus over here. I don't know. <laughs> no, <laughs> we, we, we good. We good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, okay. So, yes, I had to let go of that too. So, check this out. This is why I say ignorance is bliss because it allows you to be happy and just not knowing some shit, right? Because knowing makes you have to have accountability. And so I used to go to the altar and I used to cry and be like, oh, Jesus going to fix it after a while. And I realized that I did cry harder because the choir did pick a real sad selection. So in my mind, naturally, mm -hmm. psychologically, I'm thinking about all the sad stuff in my life. No wonder I'm over here crying. Just like when it's time to give an offering and they be singing that song about give, give, give. You gotta give it in Jesus' name. You're like, yeah, I should, because Jesus don't give, give, give. But you know it. You put your whole motherfucking light bill in the basket. I don't know why you did that, because now you're talking about Jesus is going to make a way. But we so dumb. Jesus just made a way, if that's what you really believe. You just gave your damn way away. Why are you doing this? Right? But this is real, trying to be funny, but being serious. We do this in church all the time. But I'm going to tell you what happened. I'm reading, I'm studying the enemy because I'm just sick of America shit. I'm sick of my, my son in prison through the school to prison pipeline with a sentence way longer than he deserved. My brother got murdered in jail and they called it a suicide and, and it, it ain't just emotions. It's all kind of proof y'all murdered my brother and lied about it. Nobody's ever paid a price going through all the things I've gone through. They killed Tamir Rice the way they killed him. I had to cut off the TV. I couldn't take it no more. So I started studying the enemy. I was depressed for two years. I sat in my room by myself. You know, I did, I sold my little shit online. I was putting stuff on the mannequin, taking pictures, but I stayed in my room. I did my inventory. Thank, thank my mother for being the mother she, the mother she is. She was living with me and she took care of everybody. I mean, you know, I come out my room, but if you wanted to find me, that's where I was. I wasn't in the kitchen. I wasn't in the, in the living room. I wasn't, I mean, you can knock on the door. You can come in here. The door might be open, but I stayed in my room. Um, I felt guilty about my son being in a cell uh, the whole for a whole year. And it was like my bathroom bigger than his whole cell. I just felt guilty laying on a pillow. I, he can't go nowhere. I'm not going no damn where. But I was also tired of everything going on in the world. So I cut my TV off. And I started studying. And when it came to Christianity, I was learning just about what really happened in slavery, right? I'm, 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 and when I say I'm learning, people going to say, what books you read and this and that. Like, I took in everything. I sat for two years. So I watched people's documentaries on YouTube. I watched what people had to say. I read books that people recommended. I looked at these things. I read news articles. I Googled some stuff. And it took me over here to there, to there, to there. And I just was taking in everything. And when I got to what slavery was really like on the plantation, I realized that Christianity was actually used as a way to control black people. Like this is a fact. This is what they used it for. But when you go deeper, what you find is that it's a plagiarized book. So they took everything that they learned from um uh, us when they brought black people over here now people can debate if it was black people already here and i'm gonna tell you i think it was both right so yes the native americans that were originally here were black it's not the five dollar indians we see today okay um but in that you will find that spirituality is really where that comes from ephi which goes back to yoruba and even further than that if you just keep going back in the civilizations before now and what was practiced so Whenever you look to the Bible, it was it was shifted and it was changed to make you weak and actually not give you power. So 
this is why I laugh when we said earlier, like the church is the one always telling people to buy back for the guns. Why? Because when some shit go down, you're going to pray and Jesus is going to come fix it? Yeah, right. Okay. So let somebody try and bust up in your house. Go ahead and pray and see if Jesus coming. He not coming. You about to get shot. Please don't be no fool, right? So you wonder why the churches do this. Because from, from the slavery, it all, why is there, why is there verses in that say slave be good to thy slave master? Go ask your pastor to go explain them kind of scriptures and what they mean by that. Then go ask your pastor, why do y'all do rituals every Sunday? But if I do a spiritual ritual, I'm the devil. They do cannibalistic rituals every single first Sunday. It's called communion. You're taking in the body and the blood of Christ. It is a representation of that, but that is a ritual. It is a ritual. And if you went back to where the root of all this came from, you would see what that was. It's a ritual where they have put a European ritual in there that never came from Africa, where they go about eating the body parts of their deceased loved ones, feeling that that uh, a loved one will live in them. We don't eat our ancestors. Right. So you're eating the body and blood of Christ. That is a cannibalistic ritual. Right. So when you get the Holy Ghost, that's called a possession. You're being possessed by a spirit. But if you go and watch a sister in Africa somewhere in her white dress and they're chanting something and they're beating drums and they're creating an energy and they're out there summonsing a possession of a certain type of an energy or what we would call spirit because maybe they're ready to go to war. So they call it on Ogun. Not Jesus, because Jesus want to just pray a little while longer, right? So these are different things that when we look at them in the Christian way, it's one way, but you call it the devil when we try and tell you where it really comes from and so they took all of that and they use it to enslave black people so you're supposed to be see this is the thing christianity always says pray a little while longer it tells you that you should forgive your enemy and turn the other cheek you know and it says all of that because when you're on a plantation you waiting for for for, for god to come fix you you're waiting on jesus you 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 are supposed to be a good slave and this is the way it's supposed to be even the bible will tell you i can't get down with the hebrew israelites because the old testament they will try and tell you that we are under a curse by god so if we're under a curse, that means your daddy, the creator, of all things sent you to your room because you did something wrong. So why the fuck would you be trying to come out your room? Then you would just stay there and take the punishment. So is that why we just sit still like some punks? So to me, the religion changed. They took what they knew we had. They twisted it to teach us to be docile. If I see another black person that called themselves a Christian go into a court and, uh, and and forgive the person who done murdered their child will you stop that shit even white people that claim to be christians wear hoods and burn crosses in your yard and they not forgiving shit if you do something to their child like come on we, thank so, you there it is i mean i mean even, so come on and i want y'all to know that more white people practice spirituality than christianity they still take everything that was ours and embraces it and laughs at the shit that they left us White folks don't be buying this Christianity shit either. Let me tell you that, okay? When I go into these spaces and go into the spiritual stores and all of that good stuff, there's more white people in there than anything. Talk about dressing a candle. Talk about can we show them to the stage and over to the herb shelf and they want some John Conquer and some and some roots and some and some some bath, some spiritual bath. Like, man, if you don't get out of here, Karen, they in there. Hard body. More than anybody else. And black people tell you, oh, that's the devil. That's the devil. The devil. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know, but it really was a way to keep black people down. And you see it today. And I'm going to show you why you see it today, because in all of our communities, there are more churches on every corner than we care to count. And there is no change in our community. So I will tell you, they have sold you a whack fake ass God that has no power for anybody who wants to read the Bible. Let's go back to the old Testament. What was homie name? Cause see when I forget some shit, that's a lie. I let it go into the abyss. I forgot that shit. So I might pull the name wrong, even though I had it right when I was a preacher. Cause I used to study that dumb shit. Was it Jacob, whoever the hell. And, and they put all the water on, on, on the fire. You know, he said, my God, gonna burn. he said, okay. He said, look, let me, let me, let me pour my water on this shit and let me go ahead and get it soaking wet. And I'm gonna challenge your God with my God because we still going to start this fight. And motherfuckers sitting there waiting. And your God don't show up, but the other God show up. Like, I don't understand how y'all powerful. Y'all walked around the wall of Jericho and y'all blew your horns and the wall came falling down. But you can't fix a fucking project to save your life in the name of Jesus. I don't understand. And so how does Jesus make you powerful? If your oppressor hated you and thought you was worth nothing more than a dog, and this is documented in medical apartheid, 
where the father of gynecology stated this. They said black folks was equated to dogs. So you really think that they gave you the most powerful book. It's supposed to be the most powerful book that empowers you. And I would do that to my slaves. slaves. Hey, yo, Michi, the Canaanite woman, Jesus basically, Jesus called her a dog, the Canaanite woman. And you know, the, you know, the racists, they always equate black people to the Can the Canaanites, the, the cursed the cursed children of Ham. You see what I'm saying? And so when Jesus, uh, I think the Canaanite woman and her daughter, if you remember the story, was they came to Jesus about something, and Jesus told them, what, like, you expect me to cast or whatever to the dogs, like to dogs or something like that. Do you remember that sto that part of the the, the story, Michi? Um, yes and no. You talking about when he when he said he what wouldn't cast are you are you talking about the picture I wouldn't not the not the pearls to the swine, but it's another is another section where this Canaanite woman and I think and her daughter, they were looking for some blessings or something from Jesus. And Jesus told them that he didn't want he he, he didn't want to basically he's telling telling he he told her that he didn't want to give her the blessings because it wouldn't be right to give to the dogs what belong to the uh to the children or something like that oh he brings, oh, he brings the scraps yeah. yeah 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 i remember that absolutely <laughs> Because what he was saying, what's for his, he ain't supposed to. Yeah, but you know what? This is my thing, though. It's like how long we got to live, whether you talk about these stories or not, or we read it. Like, where where is Jesus really at in the black community? Like, really? I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, we could go and get into all of the deepness of where the root of all this come from and what it is. I don't care for that. I like logic. I just want you to go think if it triggers something in your brain, you go find out for yourself. It ain't my job to educate you, because what I understand is what I can do is spark an interest in your mind. But if you want to get out the matrix, waking up is completely your responsibility. Something in you has to be sparked. I can't do that for you. Right. So I just like to work in the logic of that. What has being in Christianity ever done for the black community we have churches on every corner but there is no power no change or nothing going on in our communities in our hood you know and and what i say about religion see this is the thing when you know again i was saying earlier that you have to take accountability right so the accountability in this is you can go to the altar and you can try and give it to jesus right and you can claim that he needs to fix everything in your life and if nothing good happens for you, you say oh well it wasn't meant to be or you could stop asking uh, this this made up motherfucking entity that's in your mind, right, that you keep creating things and you want to give the accountability and the responsibility to everything outside of you. How about the God you see that's going to save you? That name is whatever your name is and go look in the damn mirror. How about you take the responsibility for making your life better? Because that's your responsibility. How about when you doing dumb stuff and you know you are causing yourself to have your life be a certain way? Do your shadow work and look at yourself in the mirror and check the devil in you. See, religion and, and Christianity allows you to give credit to everything outside of you for saving you, never thinking you're supposed to save yourself. Right. And then everything that you do wrong, you blame it on some outside of you. Where the hell is the accountability? Right. So how about we just take accountability for our actions? Because if you believe that you are a child of the creator, let's give God another name, not God, but creator. If that God is a creator, then that would mean if you're made in God's image, you're a creator, too. So the truth of the matter is when people say to me, I'll throw this logic out there. Well, Michi, how come people, uh, you know, be in church and they fall out in the Holy Ghost? All of that stuff is not real. Well, I would say to you, if Jesus is the only way to get to God, then how come Muslims don't pray to Jesus, but their prayers get answered too? how come Buddhists don't pray to Jesus, but their prayers get answered too? you will find the same stories through every religion. So I'm going to tell you what it is. The common denominator is you. You are a creator. You create whether you want to or not. Everything you speak, everything you think, everything you say equates to what you have in life. I want everybody to look at their life and I guarantee you the things you think about most of the time, 
the stuff that you put your effort towards and really important in all of these, how do you feel all the time? What is the way you walk around with the feeling that is inside of you? What is your feeling? What do you think and what are you speaking and what are you walking towards? I guarantee you, you have the life you have created. Now that might be hard for y'all to swallow because some of y'all might be looking around like my life is fucked up and you don't want to take any accountability for that. So therefore you would say, nah, that's crazy, Michi. Nah, 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 I didn't create this life. Yes, you did. Because if people treat you like shit, why you keep letting people treat you like shit? If something happened to you, why do you keep carrying it? Once the act is over, it is your job to decipher what was the lesson and what I'm supposed to carry with me and get that extra shit out your bag and stop letting it weigh your life down. Because it wasn't meant to stop you. It was meant to teach you something. So step up on it and go be greater. Well, Michi is just so hard. So then stay where you are because you do all that crying to Jesus and Jesus ain't coming to save you. You better save yourself. And that's what the creator creator is really waiting on you to do so see when you really step into spirituality everything comes back to you walking with the god individually and christianity or any religion it says one road leads to god in spirituality it says all roads lead to god the road i choose for me leads there and the one you choose for you leads there you cannot tell me anything because i don't need to go to a person that says god gave me a revelation i tap into the god in me and any revelation that the creator needs to give me for my life i don't need another motherfucker excuse my language to ever come tell okay. me what the creator has for me the creator can talk to me and I can talk to the creator. So my lane works for me and your lane should work for you. And none of them should look the same because we're not the same. We're uniquely created. And this is why the Christian gets what they want. So does the Muslim, because the thing is, when you go with all your belief, you believe Jesus is real. You believe that prayer going to work. So inside, you're the one projecting, you're speaking, you're thinking, and you're focusing on this blessing. And then when it shows up, you say it's Jesus because that's what you decided to call that energy. But you really called that into your life. You're just giving the credit to Jesus, right? So it's the same thing when the Muslims get up and they pray to the North, East, South, West, alhamdulillah, whatever it is that they do, they get their prayers answered. No, they just focused on it. They spoke it. They thought about it. They walked in it. They expected it. And boom, it showed up. So the common denominator is us. We are the creators. And when you realize that, you have to take account. Ability. And that's not always easy. When you realize what the problem is in the Black community, you have to take account ability. People can't ever do shit in the black community till you get your household in order. If you're not a leader of your home, don't go out in the streets and try and do nothing out there. If your house is in shambles and you have no, re no run in your house, if you have not taught your family what they need to know, if you are not invested in getting them to where they need to be, if you have not accomplished some greater things in your household, you dare not go out into the streets because all you do is spill your problems and your toxicity on them. See, that becomes responsibility. When people say the black community need to take responsibility, I think individuals need to take responsibility. But of course, you have the church to let you just wait on Jesus and blame everything on the devil. And if that doesn't work, the liquor store is always a few feet away. You can just drown it out in pain and go ahead and drink that fifth of E&J or whatever it is. You understand what I'm saying? So this is all set up to be this way. People don't want to know the truth because ignorance says I don't have to take accountability. I can live a life, have an excuse. I just want to have fun. I just want to be ignorant to the bullshit because taking accountability is it, it, hard and knowing the truth takes the fun we've been taught from the time we were born. It sucks the fun out of everything. Don't get me wrong. My life is is my life. I enjoy it. But um, <laughs> a lot of y'all will go crazy if y'all lived in my shoes because separating yourself from society until you sit with yourself, you always think you need other people. And that's not the easiest thing to do. So, you know, I, I, I will say that I, I don't walk with Jesus. I get up every day. I honor my ancestors. Um, I have an altar. I'm not the devil. There are skulls on it and they're not real skulls. OK. Um, and all it does is represent my ancestors. You may go to a grave site. I just go to my altar and I lay my flowers there and I light them candles and I give them offering and I for walking me because I would be a fool to think that if I believed in Jesus as a spirit, that every time a spirit is, somebody's created, a spirit is wrapped up in that flesh. And then after that, they just got to go in some big holding cell called heaven. They not here with me. That's crazy. They are here with me. 
you know? And so in that vein, I want to talk to them. I want them to walk with me, not some fucking white man named Jesus that is not obligated to get me through my journey. See, my ancestors committed to something in life that I am finishing a purpose. And so in that, whatever that purpose is, it ain't got to be grandiose for everybody else. It could be a purpose for my lineage and my line and my family. But the bottom line is there are those that are willing to help me and they're actually obligated because they come from this bloodline of mine, right? So why am I asking Jesus when I got all of these willing to ride with me and they actually belong to me? So I just need y'all to think about that when they try and tell us that that's evil. So I honor my ancestors, yes. I got altars all over my house. If you're not ready, you probably shouldn't come in this mud because you'll think I'm the devil. I don't curse people. I don't hex people. But you can. <laughs> but it costs you too much to do so. It costs you too much to do so. But we do it every day anyway. Man, when you're talking crazy about people and you sending hate towards them, you sending energy towards people any damn way. You will create. I'll remind you of that. So y'all be hexing people too and you don't even know. You don't need a jar. All you need is your hatred in your mouth. Hey, Michi, I wanted to let you know, too, what you said is, is really powerful because uh, we do have with um, By the People Media every other Thursday, we have a, um, a program called Rare. It's about uh, reparations and religion elevation, where that's exactly what people like Arthur Ward, uh, he's one of the uh, hosts talk about uh definitely i mean uh, one one thursday when you're not too busy it's uh it's called the um rare power hour it's just an hour long and uh what you're talking about would would perfectly fit in we're trying to get these different churches different religions that are saying hey we believe in justice we believe in this we believe in that well what are you doing for justice for our people like if all of these churches instead of saying well you get your reward after you die whatever the case may be what about what are you doing in right here and then here and now in order to get our people uh free with reparations what are you doing as a a church an individual or whatever to push for something to to create justice which would be reparations for our community go ahead Arthur Ward you can let her know more information on it Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, yes, we have this every other Thursday. And we would like to have your uh, perspective because it's unique and it's, and, it's, uh, and, and it's actually exciting. I like hearing you talk about that aspect of life. Uh, so we will be in touch with you uh, to maybe eke out a, 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 a suitable day where you can uh, come and, uh, and uh, bring your uh, unique perspective to our platform, Michi. But the other uh, question I want to ask you is, what is it that prompted you uh, to make that viral video that caught me <laughs> on the Bill Cosby situation? Um, and that's a funny story. So um, it was a, a person that I follow on Facebook and I don't even remember his name anymore, but <laughs> he um, was a professor at some college. He's a black man. And so he would call himself always speaking for the black community. And he went live and he was um, talking down on black people. Like why y'all act like y'all don't care that Bill Cosby did these things. He's horrible. And y'all horrible. Y'all act like the all lives matter people. And when he said that, that I was so through when that man said that the all lives matter people because we don't care about these lying ass white women talking about Bill y'all done came and got Bill can we if we going back this many years I know it's some white boys that need to go to jail for some hate race crimes and all kind of stuff so let's go back then right so I think that it's a, it was a joke and it just made me so angry and the funny thing is I used to be on Facebook talking this good stuff that I'm talking now and doing my spoken word and things like that. And I might get 500 views on a video. And so I'm mad. I'm thinking I'm only going to get 500 views on a video. So I ain't been awake long. I snatched my bonnet off my head, my hair looking all crazy. Um, I'm in my house coat. I go to go in and I post the video and I, within two days, over 2 million people had seen it. Um, <coughs> World star hip hop said I was a racist lady going on a rant um but the audience was like she's not racist at all but i was just 
upset at watching other black people tell other black people that we need to care you know like I, I think that we overly pay for our crimes I thought it was bullshit when they came for Bill the way that they did they don't come for anybody else like that you know I also thought that they were trying to solidify the Me Too movement um, with a black man's face so we could act like black men were the predators here all the time and you know and switch the movement from white women being sexually assaulted from black girls to now white women are being sexually assaulted by black men so you're taking the victim which were black girls away and replacing them with white women and then they were taking the face of predators and they wanted to solidify that movement with a black man's face so I just saw so yeah. much in that and I was, yeah. I was mad as hell Oh, no, I was no. just saying, indeed, because I, I saw it too, Michi, and I, like I said, I know I helped get that two million views because I shared it with everybody in my family, any friend that I knew. I said, this sister is saying exactly what I've been wanting to say. I don't know where she came from. they like, who, what, when, when? I don't know who she is, but she's smart as hell. So <laughs> that's what I've been telling people. And I'm like, she, I don't know who she is. i never seen you before. But they were like, well, you know her. Why are you sharing this with everybody? Because y'all need to hear this, right? This is what she know what she's talking about. So um, that viral video, but see, a lot of times people don't really understand that was, it was meant to happen in that way. Right. Because you spoke to many of us exactly how we were thinking and feeling and seeing things. It's like what? And and then also whatever mystification we had or you had or whomever had was gone. It's like those scales fell off when you saw this. This is a college professor. He's mm -hmm. supposed to be speaking for us and he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. And matter of fact, what he's saying is just tearing down one of the most accomplished. If people knew who Dr. Bill Cosby was, I hope I hope that you had an opportunity or somebody had reached out to him and said, hey, you need to meet and speak to this lady here because she just said she she's just been fire in support of you for years. Um, but if that hadn't happened, I'm I'm speaking that to existence for you because I can see it happening for you. Um, and I mean, he's somebody that needs to hear what you're saying. Right. Because you were there in the fire of it. And I was like, I didn't even know it went to two million. I just know the little piece that I had uh, or the I saw it sent it out to so many people. I know it was at least 100 people. So um, I'm glad that it was it happened. I'm glad your platform is the way it is. I'm glad. I mean, somebody I went on Cuba that had something one night. And some chick was in there trying to get on you. I said, uh-uh, y'all got to come through me. I'm an elder. Y'all <laughs> ain't going to come at my sister unless you got to come through and talk to me about it. And you're not going to do that, right? Because I'm kind of tall, right? I work out and I carry a two-way. I ain't even ashamed to say it. Why? Because I'm a two-way instructor. So I can say that, right? You're supposed to be what you're supposed to have. So anyway, um, anybody else want to be able to talk to my sister Michi and um, give her this, this like, come on, family. Y'all not that shy. Y'all act like y'all shy. I want y'all to be able to come up here and, and talk to my sister. <laughs> and this is her inauguration, her debut on Twitter Spaces. I think she's been having a lot of fun. You having fun, Michi? Yes, I, I always enjoy an opportunity to talk to the people. And it's funny because I don't do this on my platform. Um, again, because I'm not a social media person. I know people don't believe me when I say that. So I ain't figured out how to even bring nobody on my platform like that. I don't use StreamYard or nothing. So that's part of it. But um, usually when I'm on a panel, it's, well, always, it's on somebody else's, you know, um, channel. And I enjoy it because I don't get to talk to the people much you know I get in there and I get to going in I'm just giving my perspective like I would if you were sitting here having a cup of coffee with me I cuss a lot because I like cuss words but as you see here today I know how to keep them to a minimal so I do like when I'm on other people's panels and I'm able to speak to the people um, because I get to show them a different side of me like I'm, I'm whatever I need to be when I need to be it and uh, you know in my own environment on my YouTube and stuff you know I'm at home I do like to cuss I'm talking to you like I would tell my cousin or something you know um, but but I definitely know how to conduct myself um, 
you know, no matter what audience I'm in front of. So I like these moments because I think it just allows people to talk to me, um, have the opportunity to ask me questions, but to have the type of dialogue that allows people to see maybe a different side of Michi than what you might get if you go to YouTube. You're still going to get all this knowledge, but you're going to get with a bunch of middle fingers. And what did you say to me in my chat? Don't get your ass blocked today. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Michi, I think I cuss more than you, for real, for real. Now, not everybody on this platform knows, but those of you who have heard me on the phone, I out cuss you, Michi. So don't even worry about it, sis. And you know what? Another thing is, hold on a second. Another thing is, I out cuss you, and um, I cuss in different languages. So people uh, have heard see? me. Oh, yeah. man. I want to be like, when I grow up, I got to go practice. All right, I got Sister Morgan up here. Morgan. Hey, y'all, what's going on? Yeah, so I just wanted to talk about the school to prison pipeline. And growing up, I always started started with, like, Columbine. But on the real, it really started out um, during the, the time of, like, quelling our radical movements. It ushered in the school to prison pipeline. And um, even like like that George Jackson era, they wrote on that because they were already in prison, you know. So it's like, I think that the main reason why a lot of things are scattered is because we don't have like a historical fact to point back to because we, we lose it. And also, it gets co op So when we run the story back, it's hard to like really decipher because you got to get through like a thousand books of bullshit. Um, just to get to like really what was going on on the ground and you know I don't know that's all I had to say about that but if you look back at that even like uh, Michelle Alexander the 13th didn't really reference what was going on in the prison movements in the 70s mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think I agree mostly in all I mean I agree with what you said but mostly that I think what I want to pull out is that like you said when we do our research, we, we have to look and look and look, and we have to learn to connect the dots because a lot of the information that we do get, we do have to remember is given to us by the same matrix that we're trying to get out of. So I would tell you, with this is the craziest thing. I think one of the craziest things that I've learned, you learn a lot of crazy stuff, but it's like, you know, you go to college, they give you all these reputable sources and they tell you things that you should look to. And it's a lot of sources out there that society will tell you they're credible. Um, but I will tell you that they're not credible um, because a lot of things have been twisted. And knowing who owns media and all of these different things that they put out there, um, I've even gone to Google and I know your college professor will get you if you use Google, Google as a reference. I get it. But I'm just saying, we go to Google and Google will give you um, certain information. I know I can't be the only one. You guys have seen it. I know you have. And you go back later to go look up something and it's completely gone. You can't find the information that you already saw anywhere. It's gone. It's like, wait a minute. I just referenced all this stuff and it took me to all these different sites and I looked it up. Now it's nowhere. The information has been changed or instead, you know, it's replaced with all of this other stuff that gives you the opposite of what was there. And so, I mean, maybe most people don't even take the time to notice that stuff. I do, um, you know, so. I think that's the crazy thing. It's like even in tr think about how crazy that is, y'all, like in trying to get out, even when you go to the information that's supposed to give you the right knowledge, even that is leading you in the wrong direction. Most times um, that leads you right back into the matrix because the people who built this wrote that, you know, um, even down to the news. We all think news is reputable sources. Um, and I will tell you the news be lying their ass off <laughs> and they all say the same thing. They read from a script. And so, um, um, yeah, I, I think that's that's the craziest thing right there. And that's I think something we need to let sink in our mind for a moment that that's how deep this stuff goes. Our government is very um, <coughs> excuse me. Our government is very um, maniacal. They're evil geniuses. And it is um, like one of the most brilliant things I've seen, but in such an evil way. Um, you, they control the masses and they don't touch us. Most times we all often think that our thoughts are our own, our movements, our decisions, the way we go about life, that it's all our own. And it's not. You're actually being remote controlled and you're being told what to do and you're being herded into whatever direction they want you to go and they don't touch you at all. 
And so you think you're free. So they have enslaved a whole country of people and they've done it in a way that they have sold us the illusion of freedom. <laughs> the last thing we are is free. And so, um, and I know some people can't understand that because we're going to be like, oh, well, I can go outside. I can do what I want. Like you don't understand the depths of slavery. Slavery was all about money and dollars. And so there's very much slavery and it still all comes back to money and dollars. They've just done it different. But yes, you're definitely enslaved and oppressed. You are more enslaved and oppressed if you're black in this country because it's levels to this. But let's be clear, everybody that's a citizen in this country, <laughs> they don't know they're feeling it, but they're all a part of it. We all are. That's how that's how fucked up this country is. They they use their citizens um, so that they can fill the pockets of a few and live out all of their sick, that one percent that runs it all. So they can just, you know, people who are greedy and just never get enough. Once you have so much money, you just whatever the fuck I can do. They, they find interest in doing what they do to the masses. People are sick. You know, um, and the people who run this country are very sick. And so that's what we see a product of. So I think it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Um, and it's the hardest thing to wake up out of. So I, I, I try and go easy on the people as much as I can. Sometimes it gets on my damn nerves, but um, I get it. It's not the easiest thing to see. It's a lot of cognitive dissonance when things are brought to your attention. But it's also not a pleasant place to be. I'm going to go back again, you know, and if nobody else has nothing, and we ended it here. But I want to say this again, to be in a to be conscious is to be in a constant state of rage. Like you're always like, what the fuck? You have to really learn how to relive life and see life because everything you were taught that was real ain't real. And everything that brought you joy is bullshit. And so you have to refigure how do you find joy? How do you make sense? How do you survive? How do you separate yourself from this? When all of society is going in one direction, how do you go the other? It's not easy. So I, I will say that don't beat up on yourselves if anybody's like, well, damn, I don't know nothing that's going on after listening to this conversation. <laughs> don't, don't, don't get too stressed <laughs> out and don't beat yourself up. Like it's, it's crazy. And I want y'all to know for as much as you hear me say, I didn't always know what I know. I, I was I was not aware of any of this at one point too. So, and it didn't take me um, a million years to learn what I learned. It just took me waking up and being ready to be woke. And and the more I discovered, the more I wanted to know and receiving all of the things I was discovering and not rejecting it just because it wasn't what I always believed. Beliefs are not facts, you know. But beliefs are hard to let go of. So, especially conditioned ones. So, you know, I, I would just say that. Don't be too hard on yourself. Hey, Michi, one of the things I did, and it was like, I, I mean, when I went to a PWI, I majored in journalism, media. And one of the things I did, and I used to always like be into politics and the news and what was happening and sports and all this other, you know, things, right? So what I did, I turned off the news for a full week. And I found myself just in a much happier state of being. And everybody around me that watched the news was so depressed. Did you see the shooting? Did you see this? And na da da da. And what about the little girl? And blah blah. What about the? And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And they say ignorance is bliss, and I definitely believe that. And when that whole thing happened with Ka Kaepernick, I used to be in the sports and looking and seeing what's going on with football because I'm from the DMV, and we used to always look at Washington Redskins. I said Redskins, yes, I did. So we used to look at that, right? But when I turned, uh, turned football off, I don't even care anymore. And I don't get depressed and down when they lose. I don't care if they win. I don't know who they play. I don't care about any of that. It gives me opportunity to delve into life and care about the things around me that matter the most. I like art. I like painting. I like shooting and practicing. I like doing self-defense, talking to my friends and strategizing. That's what I do. I don't do things that are like if it's a Twitter space and it's pettiness. I don't go on there for what? I'm not a petty person. I don't have time for that. I've just never have been. So I don't go in and get in the mix of things that don't interest me. And I think people need to decide to pick and choose on what they what foolishness they either participate in or what riches they choose to partic participate in. And mm -hmm. I think that's something like you know like we were saying one to grow on. Mhm. Mm I just want us to be more, I want everybody to be in a position to choose. I think that, like I said, we get so caught up in survival. That's hard to do. So I, I wish on everybody, 
I think the biggest benefit from my life and not being attached to everything is that I don't feel the need to hurry in life. I don't feel the need to answer to anybody in life. <laughs> um, everything that I'm that matters to me is close to me. Um, and they have that same freedom in life. Um, and I get time to think. You know, I think that we don't even know what we like. I would say to anybody listening to this now or is going to listen to it later. You know, when you hear this, I would ask for our hustle and bustle in life. Do y'all have hobbies? Like, you know how many of us don't even know like, a hobby? Who the hell got time for a hobby? You'd be surprised at stuff you might enjoy doing just because it's enjoyable, right? We don't even have the time for those things in our life to be able to choose anything. You know, you said something sis, about, you know, I hang out with my friends, I go talk to them, I go to the range, I this and I that. Like, I want our people to have those choices in life. I want you to wake up and decide you want that you're going to do what you want to do in life. I think that it's such a fucked up existence to be born, to work all your life, not be able to enjoy the life you've been given. Not with loved ones, making great moments, but working and toiling and striving for something always to maintain, carrying stress, worrying about where you're going to be tomorrow, what you're going to do next year, how you're going to maintain this. If you lost your job, do you need to find another? How you going to find the money for this? For the, who the hell wants to live life like that all the time? That's so stressful. And I've had that life. And so I hope for our people that we find ourselves in positions that we have the time to even just have choices and options, you know, have time to think. Like maybe you want to wake up in the morning and it's Tuesday and you just you just don't want to get out of bed today. I mean, not like you're depressing nothing, but why I got to get up at 645? I'm not doing it. I'm not unless I plan out, unless I want to go run at 715, which I do not do. But if that's your life, hey, more power to you. If you want to get up at three in the morning and take a jog, don't you want to do that? But you can't because you got to get up at eight and go to work. Right, and so well, you know what, Nietzsche. I feel that people must have hobbies because a hobby is a form of re self repair. Most people don't have yeah. the time for hobbies. Man, I don't know. I, I, question yeah, out there. Some people I like that. I want everybody to ask themselves that. Like, do you have a hobby? I like, do you like to shoot? Have you ever thought you wanted to go learn like archery or something? Would you like to go boxing? You ever thought about that? Like, do you want to go back to dance again? You like, I don't know. I just go to work and I pay bills. <laughs> Most people don't have hobbies. Like, you ever wanted to play an instrument? Have you ever bought it and just decided you're gonna go play it? You know, have you ever decided to learn another language? Like, it's a lot of things I think people don't do because. They stay in survival mode. They ain't got time. I would like to learn another language, but for what? It ain't going to better my life to pay these bills. And that's the problem. We should be able to do things that ain't about paying bills. We just do it because we enjoy it. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Bon. Très bon. Très bon, mademoiselle. <laughs> <laughs> look, see, look at you. Y'all just sitting up there like, what the hell did she just say? <laughs> Kelly knows. You said something uh, in French, right? <laughs> yes, yes, I did. I said, absolutely. That's very good. I said, That's very what's, good your, what's your hobby, Nietzsche? Well, um, that's funny that you asked that. I don't know. Well, let me see. I do a lot of things. So I guess I look at hobbies different because in my life, I spend a lot of time by myself. I like to listen to audio books. Um, I do do that. Mm -hmm. I listen to a lot of psychology audio books. I just decided I'm getting ready to go into the bus system I told you about with Shem. So I'm under the weather. I'm getting better now. We, we all kind of got sick. And uh, so I go into training next week and I'm enjoying it. I think I'm going to turn that into boxing after that. But um yeah, I think to help with some of my, my stress, I be stressed. I do be wanting to punch somebody, but you can't go around <laughs> punching people. You can't do that, y'all. So, you know, you'll go to jail. And I know that. So, <laughs> so I got to find hobbies to do that. Now, I am thinking about going back to playing the violin. I used to play the violin a long time ago when my kids were smaller. Um, ever since I was a child, I got I had the violin when I was in school. But I would have to cut off my nails to do that. But, you know... I, I might be willing to do that. I got to cut them down anyway for my training with fighting. But um, probably that would be it. Yeah. I listen to audio books a lot. That's my thing. I don't go out of the house much. I don't like outside because um, people get on my nerves. And um, <laughs> I'm going to stay in my house. So I got to deal with folks. Um, but yeah. 
I'm not an outside person, but I listen to audiobooks and music, and I write poetry. So I, that's what I mean. I, I spend my days doing what I want to do. So I don't know. I guess I do so many things I like that I don't know what I would call a hobby. I guess I just live my life because I write poetry. I like to do that. I'll listen to music with my daughter, um, and we write together. She, I can't sing to save my life, but she be she be going in, and so I have her mm -hmm. sing, and I write the verses. You know, so I do stuff like that. Um, yeah, I Michi, I heard you sing a little bit. I think you could carry a tune better than me, so please stop that. <laughs> but uh, you can sing a whatever. Bit. Well, y'all do not want to buy my album if I'm singing. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a nice album. <laughs> I'm, well, at I got, auto, I'm at the auto tune the whole thing. <laughs> well, I got three. I just kind of work them all in. Most people know what my hobbies are. My my uh my hobbies are wine. Everybody knows that. Okay. And okay. Uh, and uh, reading books on history and politics. And I'm also, my, I'm an audiophile. I'm, I'm into really specialized high-end audio equipment because I'm into music. So that's what I do. Okay. So, yeah. And, you know, I think I'm going back out with some of my hobbies. So I've been thinking about um, doing a spoken word show. I don't know um, for all of y'all that are here if anybody knows that for me. People always ask me, how did I get my name? Because, you know, folks be like, you just trying to be blacker. That's why you named yourself Michie. <laughs> that's what folks tell me, right? So that's actually a stage name. Um, I do spoken word. And so that was given to me and, um, it stuck. And so after that, I was always meet GX at every show that I went to, cause my spoken word is just like the messages I gave tonight. I just delivered in another form. Um, but it's definitely talking about the same kind of stuff, right. To get the message across. And I will say I am dope. I just want y'all to know. <laughs> so some, some people like just dope as they think they is. I, my, my spoken word is dope. Um, but I haven't done that in a while, you know, COVID and everything hitting and I moved. So I am really thinking about this winter getting back on the spoken word scene. So Georgia will probably catch me at some open mics and things like that. And maybe I'll do a live show on um, MX Network or something. But that is definitely one of my hobbies that I love. Um, the black community has really pissed me off lately and hurt my feelings. I'm suspended for two weeks. So in my hurt, I always write. So I've written new stuff that I want to give to the people. So um so yeah, I may I may pick up that hobby a little bit more. Y'all might say a little bit more of that and have some time for that. That's the stuff that's good to my soul. All this other stuff and fighting the government and fighting black people and fighting on YouTube. Y'all, I'm tired. I, I just need a break from all the goddamn fighting. So I think I'm going back to playing my violin and some spoken word. We need some love around here. There it is. That's why this space is like it is. I, I, I'm glad that people that um are... are I guess coming in or, or can't have come in or thinking about coming in to start up anything or not here. Cause like I said, they know my energy. I'm very positive. I'm about progress for our people. If they got a problem, then I don't want them here. I mean, that's not, that's not how I do my Twitter spaces. And um, I'm going to let uh, Sebastian Cumberbatch, he stepped up. I'm going to let you um, post your question or comment to our sister brother. Go ahead. Hey, how you doing? How you doing, Michi? I'm good. How you doing? I'm doing fine. And uh, peace to the panel, peace to everybody in the room, and thanks for inviting me up. Hey, I wanted to touch on the, the World Economic Forum. I, I was watching your YouTube channel, I think it was about a month or a month and a half ago, and you were breaking down Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, and how these people are behind what's going on in the world, like with the COVID-19 Oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to get us cut off. But but the pandemic, uh, the monkeypox thing that's going on, how how they're behind uh, the destruction of our monetary system and also the food processing centers and also the controlled demolition of America. I don't think we talk about the intellectual masterminds that are behind everything that's going on in the world with the uh, supply chain crisis, what's going on in Sri Lanka. I want you to touch on what's the World Economic Forum and, and what they're all about. Okay, well, I can't speak specifically to the World Economic Forum um, in that sense of that, but I will speak as far as um, people like Bill Gates um, and definitely like the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds. Like earlier when I was talking, there is, I guess to be more specific, there is a group 
a small group of people um, compared to the population in this country. And yes, they are the ones that run all this stuff. Like if you look at Bill Gates, he's behind all of the all of the stuff that has to do with vaccinations. He's always talking about population control um, in his interviews. And he always says the answer to that would be vaccination. So, I mean, people say this to our face, but I don't know how many people on here in our hood stop to really listen to a, a Bill Gates interview, right? Who does that in our hood? Maybe that's the problem because they tell you to your face what they're doing. Um, and he owns so much of the land and it's important because he owns so much of the farming land. Um, what we are looking at right now, I will tell you this, that with the inflation and the, um, uh, um, the shortages on everything that is on purpose. I will say that, that they run these things for a reason. Um, I will tell you that, um, I mean, I don't know what all you can say on Twitter, which can I want to get you in trouble, but <laughs> I don't know if they'd be like, you, you over here giving misinformation. They're not going to get me in trouble. Sir. Look, whatever they you talk about the government trouble. and stuff like this, they swear it's misinformation, but People should understand that it is people that are controlling this. So, yeah, we talk about the government if we get more into specifics. And so um, when when Biden says that there is another um, pandemic coming or we should prepare for the next one, you should listen to Biden. Um, he's saying that for a reason that's priming you and getting you ready. And so we're coming into the season where everybody's supposed to start getting sick. Um, and so everybody's about to start getting sick. Right. And it's going to be all these new strands and everything else. Um of course, we're in the great reset of society. People should look at where the inflation and all these things are going. And they're like, oh, we're in a recession. Things will even out. Well, really, I don't believe that things are going to be evening out like they used to before. Um, people should pay attention to things like cryptocurrency and stuff of that nature because they are going in these directions. And they keep playing these games with the people that are big, that play with cryptocurrency. And they'll buy a lot. They'll endorse some shit. Then they sell a lot. You know, they play these games. But trust and believe me, they are moving. Moving us over to another currency. Um, uh, um, American dollar ain't worth shit. Like our money's not worth nothing. It's not backed by anything. It's just print it off, print it off. They just give it to you. Here you go do this money. Like it's it's no real value to it. And I want people to also understand that there, there may come a time if you can't get into your banking system, what are you going to do? You know, so the conversation he's bringing up is a very big one. But yes, there is things that are coming in if you pay attention. Like all, like I said, all the farmland, how many of you know that they, the government actually um, paid them to destroy and get rid of crops? Um, there were things that happened that destroyed crops when it came to weather. NASA creates weather and these are things that they haven't seen before. So much food was destroyed and now they're telling us that there's this shortage of stuff, right? Um, meat factories have been sold to China and people overseas, right? And so even the, the, the food we normally get, you wonder why the shelves are empty in a lot of places um, and there's not a lot of meat. Um, so it, it, it's, it's so much to be said about all of this, but I will tell you that if we look at the economy and the way things are going, when we're looking at all of the things that are happening right now, this is a big part of maybe what we come back to the conversation. We should be prepared. Like, this is what I'm saying. I don't think we think these things are happening. What are we all doing if tomorrow something hits the banking system and nobody's ATM card works and every transaction you use is declined because the banking system has failed, their machines aren't working, you can't get any money out or something of that nature. Anybody going to say that can't happen? That would be crazy for you to live in America and think something can't happen, right? They could do it easily and blame it on some other shit. I don't know why they're giving us public service announcements in New York for nuclear you know, attacks. What? So you should pay attention to what's really going on here. What would you do? And the funny thing is, did you notice how in COVID, even the change got sick? Now, what I mean by that is, why the fuck we had a change shortage? If it's the same change that's been circulating all this time, where did it go? They were preparing you to use your plastic. Like if you did use cash for the few people who walk around with cash, COVID taught you not to. Because what happened was if you don't have exact change, they couldn't give you back any change. So stores were telling you, you have to be willing to let us keep your change because we don't have any change to give you if you don't have exact amount. So now people want their stuff and they leave in two, three dollars, five dollars and they got to give it to you because you don't have any money to give them back. Like, I don't understand how you ran out of money when the same amount of money is in circulation. So when COVID happened, where the fuck did all the money go? That makes no 
sense. It does for what they're trying to do. But you get what I'm saying? Why they do that? Because they're moving you over to everything being a transaction, 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 swiping your plastic. We're all so used to it. If that shit shut down tomorrow and don't tell me that it couldn't, who going to get gas? How you paying your bills? You going to get some of that non-existent food that's happening on the shelves right now? I'm just saying, y'all, like we don't ever prepare for this kind of stuff. And if you pay attention to the signs, like there's a lot going on in this country and we shouldn't be distracted by other things. There's there's a lot of stuff going on. Listen to what the people are talking about. The presidents, the food shortages. Fuck what's being said on the TV because I don't even watch TV. So how meet you know all of this? Because I've been in probably like seven grocery stores across the whole state of Georgia from traveling to the retreat we went to and everything. And there are shelves and shelves with no damn meat on them. I see it with my own eyes. I know people who call me and send me pictures and be like, yo, look, Meech, I got a truck driver friend. He texts me and be like, look at the grocery store here. So this is not a joke. Right? And so what was being said by the person who came up here, like, yeah, we should be paying attention to the economy, what's going on. We don't, but you know what? We're in so much survival mode. People are like, what? Girl, I got to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> I got this CNA job. I got to pay my kids daycare. What are you talking about if it go down? Well, I don't know what I'm going to do, what I'm supposed to do. Like, our people don't want to hear this because I think we're so ill-prepared. They're like, I don't know what I would do. And I don't even know what you want me to do. I think it's a bit overwhelming. Um, but it doesn't mean... Well, that... mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I would say, but I don't, I, I think that's, we still need to make steps to prepare for these things. So I you agree. Know, you should have yes, some investments. Yes. You should have some gold in your house. I mean, I'm just telling you the truth. You should have some survival supplies. You should have some food, some survival food. You should have water. You should have a couple of months worth of household goods and things as well. Cause those are shortages. You should have your gun. You should have some ammunition. You should have a, you a solar panel so you can have power from the sun and a solar panel generator. Um, and you can bring that in your house and plug in your refrigerators or whatever. Um, there is a website online where you can also invest in gold, y'all. And they send you like little co coins and smaller pieces so you have it in increments. Because um, I will tell you this. If when and if all else fails, there's always stuff to barter and trade. And I know y'all like, what that mean? Like we don't live in that kind of society. Okay. But if the system goes down, if you don't have anything that's worth something to barter with, and I laugh at all these big um YouTubers because they be like, Yeah, you know, it, it would if the system go down, I got all this gold on my neck. And I be thinking to myself, so you gonna give somebody what? That whole damn chain for a loaf of bread? And some milk, <laughs> you go get him all of that. Like you, that makes no sense to me, right? What you doing in, in in this time? If it's bad like that, you going to your jeweler and you wait for him to break it down. So it would be wise when people invest in a lot of things. I think we don't tell people about gold. You can get gold in small increments, and that's the way you would want it if you would have to use it at a time that the economy failed. And those sites are online, um, everywhere, and they come straight from mints and. You can, but I will tell you this: let like part of this rabbit hole is that if you buy enough gold, um, when they send you gold, your name is on a registry, and there is a law that states that the government can confiscate all gold <laughs> if they need to, because they some fucking thieves. So on that note, I would just leave that there. But they do know who buys gold, and they can come get your shit if they say they need it. And thank you, Michi, for that answer. One of the things I was gonna remind people too. A few years ago, I'm in the DMV, right? So a lot of the economy around here is pretty, um, uh, compared to the rest of the country, is running off the federal government. But remember when the federal government shut down for like three months and you had people that normally are pretty solid with whatever they have and they are, um, you know, making six figure salaries and they did not know where they were going to get their next meal because they did not prepare. Yeah. And they're going and asking them, what, where can I get something to eat? And they had like elders, like my parents, they were like, what do you mean? They grew, my dad grew up with no running water, no electricity. So he was like, what? This is like, I'm growing my food and, and, you know, vet, fruit and vegetables. And we have a storehouse pretty much in our home because they grew up in tight times back then. 
But um, and they're from the country. So they're like, what are you worrying about? But at the same time, people that were working, making these large, you know, large wages or whatever, but they had to pay off mortgages for every month. And they were terrified and they couldn't figure out where they were going to get their next meal. So people can't forget that. And I try to remind people, say, remember the government shut down for three months? Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. So it, it, nobody says it can't happen again. There is no guarantee. Um, uh, Brother Ben Joseph, it's on you. Hey, how's it going, Michi? I'm I'm good. How you doing? All right. Yeah, I, I have a. I'll ask you a question. I'm not trying to run you down or nothing. I have a son that's biracial, uh, Blasian, and uh, I know people say that uh, if you're biracial, no, you can't speak on uh, black topics. Uh, how do you deal with that? I could. Uh, I, I can say what I want to say, <laughs> Rose. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is the thing, Ben. This is my thing with Sister Michi. She's worked harder and stronger and longer in our community. So what? What the fuck? No, I mean, y'all. No, but I hear what he's saying because I get it. I, 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 just want, I just want to know I want to say what word. I really want to say. And my answer to Go that ahead, is, Go ahead. my answer to that is, I don't give a damn. I don't. I don't care what people think. You know what I've learned? I've learned that I'm a white girl when I say some shit to the black community that they don't like. When I'm saying some shit they agree with, oh, sister, go ahead. At the end of the day, I rise and go to sleep with Michelle. I know who I am. This fight started personally for me. Um, my brother was murdered. It's a, my, my son, what happened to him? Um, the experiences that I've had with the police, the things I've seen in this life and have dealt with through the government, right? Um, so for me, this fight very much started out being personal, but also I take it personal when I see what's happening to my people. So for anybody who give me that flack or say I can't do the work or I'm not black, I would just say they stupid and stupid people are like my pet peeve. It, it irritates the hell out of me. So I try and stay away from them people um, because if, if me being biracial means that I'm not black enough to do anything for the black community, I'm going to need them to give a lot of the, the, the our, our ancestors back. Like, cause you know, like Malcolm X, you know what I'm saying? I, and his grandmama, you know, white. So like at the end of the day, I mean, we keep going further back. Like, you know, there's plenty of that. So I think my work speaks for itself. And I just think that part of who I am, if this is what I'm supposed to be doing in life. I, I'm, I'm built to be who I'm supposed to be. And in that being built to be who I'm supposed to be, I don't give a damn wouldn't oh you ain't supposed to be i bet you i'm still gonna be working as i ask i bet you i'm still finna do another survival retreat i bet you i'm still finna uh continue to do the black agenda i'm still finna put black people on i'm still finna keep teaching people how to make money like i don't give a damn it ain't gonna stop what i'm doing so it don't matter to me you know what i'm saying and most of the people who say that at some point if they watching me tough enough they come benefit from what i have to offer so eventually they shut up any damn way or they go away but i don't let it bother me i don't i know why i do what i do i know who i am and i'm not gonna argue with you because i ain't got time it's too much shit going on for me to well, i'm supposed to stop because you think i'm not black enough like shut the fuck up you ain't got nothing better to do with your day so that that's what i say <laughs> to that it doesn't bother me um in the way that people might think that it does it doesn't Okay, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Ben. But I mean, I don't, I don't even. To me, that's like a um, surface skimming. I need, I need depth, and I, I don't even. It, I just can't even. You know, uh, that well, what's that? I don't, even, because, I don't get that. I do, I do, because you said that you have a son that's biracial, right? Yeah, he's a uh, Blasian. Yeah. So I get he's asking in that because he's going to grow up in a way that when he tries to be about his black community or be black, he may be told you're not black enough, shut up in a lot of different situations. And that's just the truth of the matter. So I think that that's maybe why he brought it up. So I get why, why you, you know, why you said it because yeah. of that. 
Yeah, I'm because you get because, you uh, get slack. You're not black enough on one side sometimes. I ain't gonna lie about that. And then the community will tell you, you know, of course the other side will be like, well, you ain't this enough. So, you know, I would say that it's all about in how he's raised in, in his culture of whatever that is that you're choosing. And as long as he understand that, you know, he's black and that's how he's, when, when it comes to racist things and the way people see him, they're going to see black in him as well. And so if that be the case, he just needs to understand that. Right. Um, so I think instilling that in him, he grows up with a confidence of who he is um, in both veins, you know, um, of whatever his culture is, even from his other side. Like that's all about in the raising him that he be confident in who he is. And then it won't it won't damn matter. You know, people gonna always have an opinion. And yeah, he going to be told he not enough of this or he's not enough of that. But he needs to be firm enough in who he is that he know that don't define him. and He don't give a damn. And I mean, I think that's my best you know answer answer in that um he got he got to be okay with who he is because that's where i stand so and then it won't bother you otherwise it it, it, may, it may bother him you know i know yeah, some uh, people who who hate it and it bothers them yeah i don't raise him as a, he's not raised as a bat ratio i don't play the half game so he just raised as a black man you know i don't play the right. i'm half of this and half of that bullshit you know what i mean because the other half ain't gonna accept his ass anyway so right. He gonna What's have a black experience in his life, so I mean, you right about that. I mean, that's what I think I say to everybody. Like, I don't. They be like, "Yeah, cause you have white," and I be like, "I really be wanting them to tell me, like, okay, so how do I use this as privilege? Like, I've never learned yet in this life. I flip that out and be like, yeah." So you do know police officer, right? I'm half white. So you can't treat me like this. Like that doesn't work for me. If I try to act like Karen, I'm going to jail. <laughs> right. They're not giving. So you're right about that, right? Like the, that's what it is. Like this is the, for me to not do the work is crazy because I experience the thing they're telling me to stop fighting. That's my experience too, you know? And whenever I be like, yo, so tell me something that I don't deal with that you deal with, you know? Um, being black and we can't do this colorist thing because there are light skinned black people versus dark skinned ones so you know you can't do that just in general blackness what do y'all go through that I don't and they can never answer that question so that's the thing if I'm caught up in the same fight and this is what I'm seeing that is in this country I have all right to fight it just shut the hell up that's that's what I say about it but yeah he's a black man so just make sure he's strong in that and he gonna look at people like they crazy when they be like, you're not even black. He gonna be like, what? What is wrong with you? So long well, you as he feel that way, he'll be all right. Well, you know what, Michi? That, that is part of what I've always perceived at this, as this racial silliness, which is one of the most dip, the disappointing things that come out of the mouths of American freedmen or, na or Native American blacks, whatever you want to use. Because one of the markers of being black in America is every one of us are either bi or tri-racial in some kind of way. Yeah. That's one of the markers of being an American freedman. You know, I, I, I regard uh, one's level or, or one's kind of mix as the early mix, you know, the slave rape period when we were still enslaved, the middle period when we were just out of slavery, some of that was consensual and some wasn't, and in the late mixes of which you are part of, and my grandson is a part of, and is we cannot escape that. So for us to make light of that, the very people that are making light of that and you are themselves biracial, when you look at their real genetics, it's, it's a wasteful uh, endeavor. And it's also a destructive one that takes us away from the real work of liberation. That's how I look at the shit. Absolutely. I, I, I agree too, because again, if it's about fighting this fight, you know, my, my argument, you know, if I have to say something on the other end, it doesn't make sense to say, you know, now let me say something. If somebody want to argue in your DNA, you ain't as black as me. Okay. That's one argument. Okay. You got two black parents, your DNA might say you're blacker than me. All right. But when mm -hmm. it comes to the fight that we have, I just think it's ridiculous for people to say that, like, because you're not all the way black, you shouldn't fight this fight. So what is, do they say about the people who is all the way black and they be in here cooning and they be selling us out to everybody? So we're supposed to trust them based on just the fact that they're black? Like, 
<laughs> it's, it's, right. it's, it's just ridiculous. You know what I'm saying? Like we're all in the same fight. And you're right. It's stupid to me because how dare you think we're going to get anywhere in life and you want to ally with everybody else, but you don't want to ally with people who are in the same fight. Like, let's be real. We all seen as niggas in this box and you want to play. Let's separate mm -hmm. the nigga from this nigga. Like, really? They all look at us the same way. So I don't, I, I don't understand that. Um, right. I think, I think it's a, 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 I don't know what this infighting thing is. It's like, they just want to, I'm in my group by myself, leave me alone. Like even with reparations, let me say when we, when we talk about whether, you know, ADOS or the, whatever it is that everybody has, you know, for this is what we call ourselves, you know, um, even in that, that's about reparations. But when we get to this fight, it's about us all. And then we go to Pan-Africanism because it, it doesn't matter what kind of black you are in this country. You still going to feel the brunt of racism. So that's a whole different fight, right? But we talk about reparations. It's just that. And somehow that reparations turns into separation of us and other black people in this country. So I don't know what that shit is about, but we a small ass per se. And we just love dividing ourselves so we can be even smaller. I don't know what kind of war tactic that is, but it's stupid and we should stop it immediately. <laughs> yeah, because we divide ourselves internally, but the yeah. white man with the one drop rule brings us all together with his shit. See, the white man unifies us with the one drop rule, but then we get amongst ourselves and start parsing who's black and who, which is crazy. You know, and it's just something that we need to move away from. I mean, and, and quick, you know, that's all I got to say on that. Go ahead, Kelly, your hand is up. Anybody else that want to come in and speak to Sister Meech X, come to the stage now. I'm not going to hold a sister forever. Uh, she's been on for three hours, and we're going to probably shut it down at 1030. I'm going to give her, um, you know, she's she's graced us with three hours and nine minutes of her time, and she's been doing great and answering these questions. But Kelly, go ahead, sis. Okay, what I wanted to say is, um, getting back to Ben's point, Regardless of who has had a union with who, um, if it's black, white, white, black, female to male, male to female, Asian, whatever, whatever the other ethnic group is, at the end of the day with the child, it depends on what that child is going to identify with when they get older. So depending on how they identify, for me, is how I'm going to treat you. So if you don't want to identify as one of me, then that's fine. Um, then, then I need to navigate accordingly. And I think that that is, and Ben mentioned that he is um, raising his child as a black man. I get that. I understand that. But at the end of the day, it depends on what he, what your child, or not just, I'm just using as an example because you're the most relevant, um, prevalent one right now. Um, it depends on what that child is going to identify with when they get older. I'm done. Absolutely. I think you are right about that. Um, I think that there is, um, when you're talking about the effect of how they identify, the funny thing is I always laugh because I think to myself, oh, so you don't identify with being black. Wait until life wakes you the fuck up. <laughs> so I always laugh at that moment for those biracial people because, yes, they can identify with whatever the fuck they want. But the thing is, in the fight of racism, is how does this country identify you? And that's really what it is. So I always laugh at that. But you're right. Um, and I will tell you, watching biracials grow up, I find those that have a white mother um, versus a black mother it's a difference. And I think that's because the mother is the nurturer because all of the biracials I've ever met that really be like, they think they white or something. <laughs> if they mama be white, you know what I'm saying? But she nurtured them. She's their first teacher. You know, she's the one that does her daughter's hair and all of that versus my mom. She's a nurturer. You know, she's the one that brought her culture into the home. She cooked. So her meals were what she cooks. You get what I'm saying? So the mother has a lot 
to do with influence on a child in nurturing the culture of who they are and everything from what they do in that, right? Um, so I do find that when I look at biracials. Um, but like I said, I always laugh when I see those ones who really like feel like, oh, yeah, I'm white too. <laughs> I'd be like, okay, yeah, you go tell that to life. So I just always be waiting for that moment to humble them. And they'd be like, oh, but in real life... <laughs> <laughs> I'm black too. Yeah, you black too, stupid. <laughs> so I feel like their parents fail them when they really allow them to think, oh, you don't have to, you know, fit in this box, honey. Like, yes, you do. Yes, correct. I just had uh, the Friedman. I think he had to he had to check out and then check back in. But um, yeah, I definitely wanted um, everybody. Well, we've been on here for a minute, and I don't know, Michi. I think you're part of the family now, sis. I mean, you've been on here with us for a while. Um, <laughs> I mean, we didn't tell you any of our background or any of that stuff. I mean, we talked a little bit about politics, but we see po uh, certain things as far as po politics as power. We did have uh, a few candidates that had run on a reparations platform. We are re definitely reparationists. That means uh, we definitely know that we are owed reparations. We follow the work of uh, Dr. William Sandy Darity and his book, From Here to Equality, along with A. Kirsten Mullins, who had written a book. Um, and we've been doing this work out here. We marched at, um, I mean, we. I'm, I'm not going to march anymore. I'm tired of marching, but <laughs> I'm not going to march anymore. I just know that just dissipates the energy because I've been marching for too long. Well, you know and what? It just depends on what we marching for. You know, True. I mean, I if, if we trying to change a law, I would say before we march, if we're going to go to the streets, shouldn't we have people like signing, you know, what you call that? A petition? Like, don't petition, you got to get yeah. some on, 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 the, on the books? Like, can we throw this out there first and start with signatures? So while we marching, let's go get the signatures. So I just think it's about it's about using it what it's for. You know, we march for everything. I don't know why, but <laughs> it's like it's like ginger ale in the black community when we get sick. Give me some ginger ale. Like, it's, oh my God, it's a problem. We gonna go march. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. march for everything. And you're right, you know. <laughs> and it does it. I mean, and then it's like a lot of times it's like you turn the corner, somebody running, people just get up and run too. They don't even know what they're running from. But it's like, for marching, you got to know what you're marching for and is this going to be effective? And for me, I'm looking at, okay, um, if you're talking about millions of people out there marching, then we need to have a, a cause and effect. What are we marching for? And what do we try, what do we see as the end goal? What's the end game for what we're doing? So that's one of the other things that I definitely want, you know, people to kind of keep in mind. But we're about this uh, education and getting our people more knowledge. I know that you are, too. And I want to thank you for that. Arthur Ward, did you have something to say? No, other than uh, uh, being uh, thoroughly enjoyed uh, by uh, uh, Madam Michi being on our platform, I really I'm glad to finally have a, uh, well, not a face-to-face, -face, but at least a voice-to-voice -voice conversation with you. <laughs> okay. And I'm hoping that you'll come back soon and also uh, appear on one of our uh, rare programs to drop some of your um, uh, wisdom regarding spirituality and hopefully joining it with reparations on that program. So that's all I have to say. Absolutely. I want to thank you um, for having me again. And I don't mind. I'll come back. So just, you know, you know how to contact me. <laughs> you have my assistant number and stuff. So definitely, um, you know, make sure that I have the links when you guys are doing stuff. That's probably the biggest thing, because um, if I got to remember, I'm telling you, I ain't remembering. But I had the link. It was text to me. And so I had it. I came over. I set the reminder. So, yes, I'll definitely come back again um, and, and do any other shows you guys would want me to do. Um, 
that that's fine with me. Um, I feel like oftentimes the people that are doing the work, we're not the big group. Um, we're the small groups of people. And so, um, you know, this is where it starts with people who really want to hear the message, who really want to do the work, who really are looking for solutions. Um, and then taking them right back to our communities and our homes and implementing them. Um, I think that one of the most effective ways to get stuff done is still word of mouth. Um, and so as we begin to really find the smaller group of people who are serious, even if it's not about being the leaders, you're serious about changing your situation and finding the solutions, right? Those numbers are small. And so those are the people that we're supposed to be reaching. So don't like feel like, you know, I'll tell you right now, I could talk to an audience and have had this conversation in front of an audience of thousands, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, it would have been a group this small that would have received what I said and actually did something with it. It wasn't just interesting. You see what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I don't ever despise the smaller spaces that like are out here doing the work. I don't think that the people doing the real work get enough of the um, highlights. And that's where I'm at now, where I'm just trying to do the work. And so for anybody you out in the community doing the work, I don't care if we disagree on how the work gets done. I don't care if, um, you know, you have a different way about going about things. As long as our goal is that we're trying to make um, forward strides for our people. Like this is where I am in 2022. Um, y'all ain't gonna see me on YouTube much beefing with nobody. People gonna get sick of me because I'm about to just give nothing but solutions. That's what they finna get from me. You know, the problem, I keep getting punished for that. I'm gonna talk about that on MX Network. But for me in the work, like I love these 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 spaces and the people that are doing the work. So know that, um, yeah, I'm down to come back or for anything that you guys are doing, I would definitely keep you in mind, um, sis, about what we're doing. We are doing another retreat. I'll make sure that you get that information. I think it's going to be like the first week of October um, once everything is set up. But we are always looking for instructors and people. MX Network is always looking for black people that are doing excellent things. So we will come to you and we will definitely interview what you're doing um, as a solution or, you know, a 2A Tuesday or, you know, if you out there and you directing and you just directing with your iPhone, if your movie was kind of good, send it to me. <laughs> I put it up there, right? <laughs> just don't be giving me no whack stuff, man, in the sense of the message. Let's give something better. We do got a little drama up there for the drama people, but we more prefer solutions, right? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm down for all of that. So anybody in the chat listening to this, anybody who listens to this later, if you're doing some work in the community, please reach out to me. I am in Georgia and I don't just be on these YouTubes. I also be in these real streets. Um, I work with um, New Era the Atlanta chapter. And so if you guys are looking to do work in the community, please email me to Real Michi X. We, I will put you in touch. And when we're doing work in the community, please come and work with us. Um, but wherever you are, if you're doing something in any of those veins I described, please hit me up. You got a business. Remember to give me your, um, if you have a commercial, um, something that advertises it, I will put it in our business video directory for free if you black. Um, if you're not, uh, you're going to need to call CNN. I don't know what to tell you. Um, but you can give me yours if you're black and I'll put it up there. Don't cost you nothing. I just want to see you thrive, right? Um, so anyway, I think that's about it. I don't think I missed nothing. But thank y'all for having me. Um, I really appreciate this. All right, sis. We want to thank you so much for um, gracing us with this time. And we've been on here for three hours and 20 minutes or so. Wanted to definitely get the positive work that you've been doing lately uh, within the past two or three uh, days or two weeks. I mean, I don't know how you do it. I honestly think that you're a cyborg, you're half woman, <laughs> half amazing um, or something. I don't know how you do it. You just, I mean... You got me inspired. I've tried to work hard, but I'm going to just try to work that much harder for the community. And I know everybody that's been on here has, has felt the same way. Um, I want to thank you so much for being able to uh, come onto this platform. Of course, you're going to come back again because that's, hey, this is the BTP Squared family. That's uh, by the people media and be the power. And um, definitely, we want everybody to thank everybody in our audience. I want to thank my co-host and Kelly Pryor, Arthur Ward, uh, brother Mr. Ali, and our special guest for the night. Now, I mean, our sister, part of the BTP Squared family, Sister Michi X. Everybody have a blessed night and empowerment, peace, love, and reparations.